dealing with uh, the delivery of online, wholly online education. And um, so we've seen this a lot recently over the last few years with places like Swinburne Online and Open Universities Australia, um, for, for longer. Uh, and other places, uh, and other institutions trying to deliver hold online education. So I set out to sort of organise a session where we could talk about this, and this is this session. So it, we want it to be open and, and, and discursive, and if anybody wants to contribute, they can do. I'm going to talk a little bit first, if that's all right, about my experiences um, with Swinburne Online, with Chisholm Online, um, and with Graduate Online Melbourne. And then um, I'll also talk a little bit about private um, providers. Um, the the three-letter acronym is Online Program Managers. So these are a group of private companies that offer this, these sorts of services. Then Andrew is going to talk a little bit about um, using open uh, platforms like FutureLearn and other things, and she might also talk a little bit about OUA. What we're going to talk about is 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 basically what we've seen mainstream universities developing. Um, and after that, Lee's got some thoughts that he'd like to share with us, um, um, which are very interesting thoughts about alternatives, alternative ways of, of doing things, um, delivering online education um, from universities. Then we'll have a discussion. So I'm going to try and step through this reasonably quickly, but if you want to ask questions during the, the course of this presentation, or these presentations, just Dive in. It's a suddenly um, a small, small group, of this, so that's fine. So um, that's just what I've said. Let's just th th these are what we're going to go through and have a have a look at, and um, hopefully we'll have a, a good idea of, of what the different options are, so what some of the issues are, and how different places have gone about trying to solve those. And it might help us a bit uh, and inform our thinking when we think about what RMIT is, is going to do or is doing. Um, whether it should be doing things in a slightly different way. And there are some some successes, and I'll point out the things that I think have worked well. There are some things that have gone, have gone horribly wrong, and I'll, I'll point those out as well. We're recording this session. Um, I'm not sure where it'll go in the end, because some things might be a bit, you know... Might have to eat it. Indeed. We're finished. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to move over here so I can okay. see. <laughs> Be closer to the microphone, should I say? Appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> so these are so I, I've written a blog post on this, and this is some of the diagrams I started to work on. And so I'm going to talk about option. It says option two actually should be option one uh, in this list, but it's to develop the capability for delivering um, hold online courses within a university itself. And the two examples I'm going to talk about are Chisholm Online and uh, Graduate Online. Uh, Melbourne. And essentially this involves bringing together a, a team of designers and developers who have sufficient critical mass in order to cope with the complexities of wholly online um, delivery. Um, not just them, of course, because you have to have the subject matter experts as well. So it's the key relationship here is, is and in fact the key relationship in all of these efforts is the relationship between the designers and developers and the and the subject matter experts who are also going to be, in many cases, um, the teachers as well. Um, one of the reasons why these sorts of groups have started to be developed um, and built internally is because um, after over 20 years it's, it's been difficult to upscale um, sufficient staff around the institution and the complexities of our wholly online uh, delivery. In fact, many would say it's been very difficult to get uh, staff upskilled in blended learning, and the variety of options that are available now are hugely complex. When I was a, when I started lecturing twenty odd years ago, lectures, tutorials, some labs, and now you have to think about a million and one things about whether you're going to use a blog, a wiki. Uh, whether you're going to use venture capture and all sorts of things. It becomes very complex. And th that complexity is more so in wholly online because you have a whole heap of extra things you have to think about, about with the online learning experience. So this is this, this, this model with a central uh, group. It could be a, a university of our size. It could be several central groups. It could be college friends. But it, you need to have sufficient critical mass. And universities are often reluctant to uh, invest that heavily. 
some of them do. Chisholm isn't a university, of course, but it is. It um, a couple of years ago, it started to um, develop Chisholm Online initiative to deliver wholly on online courses. These are VET courses. Um, what they did was um, develop an in-house, start to develop an in-house capability, uh, working with their own staff, and they employed externals. In fact, it was Joyce and myself as academic pride at that time to actually build the content. Um, so the learning designers worked directly with the uh, subject matter experts to create a whole heap of online courses. Um, apart from that, it's very traditional. It runs in Moodle. The, the course delivery is very is, is very traditional. It's um, card-based pedagogy. Um, it's, it's highly instructivist. It's chunked material that you step through with quizzes. Um, quite boring, um, I think. Um, at the other end of the scale, but very similar in many ways, the University of Melbourne with their graduate online um, uh, it initiative is aimed at delivering wholly online master's degree courses. There's a small number at the moment. Again, they're centrally located. They've built up a team of technologists, um, designers and, and developers, and they work with subject matter experts. Um, they use Blackboard as their LMS. Again, it's a very traditional approach. Um, there's nothing that would surprise you really, uh, apart from the amount of effort that goes into the design <laughs> of their, their courses because they have the additional resources to do it. Um, but there's nothing very exciting about the way that they're doing it, I don't think. And so there's some of the things that we will suggest and some of the things that, we're, that we, in this, in this uh, our team, are already doing with people like Architect are, are in many ways much more exciting than what um, um, uh, the uh, Go Melbourne are. What is the model they use, Mark? The so they work on, um, I think it's about an eight week um, a schedule uh, for their courses. Their stu they have a separate instance of Blackboard. Mm -hmm. The students enroll into that, um, into their student management system, which is then connected to, to Blackboard. And then their, their pedagogy, again, I think it's highly instructivist. It's, 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 um, it's very MOOC-like mm -hmm. uh, videos readings, lots of readings, yep. and uh, some quizzes. So there's not a lot of um, social uh, constructivism in there. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's really n nothing too exciting, I don't think. And I guess there's a tendency by, from a lot of institutions to be quite conservative uh, in this, um, which is a shame, I think. Um, I, I think they're, they, they think they're pushing the boundaries in some respects, but therefore they have to be quite um, reticent in others about how they actually go about uh, changing their pedagogies. Um, the, the next one is slightly different um, in, in that it talks about creating a semi-external um, design and development capability rather than an internal one. And the variation on this is to create one with a partner. And this is essentially the Swimman Online model. The partner organisation in blue is SEEK, the, um, the, the, the largest earth is Swinburne University, and the institute, the, the, uh, the, the capability organisation sits in between those. One of the reasons that this is done like this is um, it was felt in Swinburne Online's case, it was desirable to take the capability out of the institution and give it its own separate identity. Uh, what are the, I, I, I don't think that this is exactly why they did it, but one of the things that Clayton Christensen talks about in, in coping with disruptive innovation is the way that traditional industries or businesses or services can cope with that is to create a, what, they call, what Christensen calls a semi-autonomous organisation. So it's, some, it's an organisation that is free of the existing business rules of the, of the parent institution. And it's something that is allowed to experiment and to do things differently. So this is what they tried to do with Swimman Online. They deliberately located it off campus. One of the things that they perceive as being problematic, and I, and I think is, is a, a real challenge, 
is the relationship between the subject matter expert and the designer developer. There is a tradition in universities of a, of a, um, of a master-servant relationship, uh, as you'll be aware, between academics and um, professional staff members. I've been on both sides of that, so I'm acutely aware of how that works. At Graduate Online Melbourne, when I was there, um, I spent a lot of time working on the colour and positioning of buttons with a particularly irksome academic. <laughs> <laughs> who knew nothing about online learning. Um, he knew a lot about his field of expertise. Uh, he knew nothing about online learning, but would insist on, on telling me. So the way that Swimming Online worked <laughs> um, was that they would take the designer developers out of, out of that immediate contact. They had very uh, rigorous and um, or organized um, into relationships between the subject matter expert and the and the designer developer, where uh, uh, where content would be s would be swapped, would be given, and and then course uh, courses would then be de uh, developed essentially in isolation. I don't think that was perfect, by any means, but I do think that there is a, a real issue that needs to be overcome with um, the relationship between subject matter experts and learning designers. So Swimbin Online started with a $10 million uh, investment um, in 2012 between SEEK and, and uh, Swimbin University. It now has about 200 staff, about 8,000 students, and in 2014 it was the <coughs> fourth fastest growing company in Australia. Um, they used Blackboard as their LMS, big mistake. Um, but nevertheless, that's what they're doing. Their learning is very traditional. Um, their online pedagogy is very traditional. They describe it as social constructivist, but I don't think it is. Um, it's very hard to do. Blackboard doesn't let you do those things, basically. Mm -hmm. it, it's a very poor um, a tool. And so, um, unless they've changed since I was there, which is a couple of years ago, two years ago, um, um, they could be doing so much better. Uh, and that's so what does a course look like there then if we've got the Melbourne model? What's the Their courses like? are about 12 weeks, mm -hmm. uh, so it's basically the same as a, as a, as a university mm -hmm. uh, blended learning course. Um, and the students um, enrol through a separate enrolment channel, I think. A lot of them are enrolled directly by uh, SEEK Learning. Um, mm -hmm. but one of the problems I would, that they had when I was there was the salespeople were on high incentives to recruit um, staff, uh, students who were not necessarily capable of, of, of doing the course. The courses tend to be aimed at um, mature age students. Well, mature age, I don't know. I don't know how to say mature age anymore. Mm -hmm. Alternative entry, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, uh, sing, uh, stay at home um, female. Um, students mid twenties, so that uh, and yeah, so so the idea was that they would have that, that flexible learning capability, um, but there were lots of difficulties. So, in terms of the teaching, um, the subject matter experts from the university did not teach into these courses. All of the courses were supported by what they called e-learning tutors, mm -hmm. who get paid uh, sessionally. And um, so the students are split into groups. So if there are 60 students in a, in a course, they'll be split into maybe three groups. Each one has an e-learning tutor who essentially is somebody, often in industry, sometimes they're, they're, they are academics, maybe they're uh, at Swinburne or somewhere else, but they're not the primary subject matter expert. Mm -hmm. but they get paid and they, they, they put their hours into supporting the students. They also have a group of forgotten the name that they used um, um, as a small group of four or five people who support them with non-academic issues um, so some technical issues but also things like fees and you know those sorts of administrative queries what Swinburne Online did do was they had a group of academic staff 
first that are within the institution. They have an academic director. And the academic staff um, are responsible for several courses. So they're generalists. So they might offer three or four courses um, in um, accounting, and then they would have one academic with employed, senior <coughs> academic employed within Swinburne Online who would uh, oversee the academic rigor and quality of that, mm -hmm. that course. What are the fee arrangements like? The, the full fee for the students? <coughs> I'm not sure. I think they, uh, they're eligible for fee help. Um, but I can't There's a remember. degree. There's yeah. a degree, yeah. yeah. They get the same fee, right? What would yeah. What would they earn, do you know? Yeah, would they pay the same price as someone that's going? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So they do. I had a teacher um, who taught at Swinburne. Yeah. And she was also one of those um, tutors. The, yeah. Um, so everything was given to her. Uh, it was into the certificate for the Navy diploma level. Yeah. And um, yeah, she had her groups assigned, but it was somebody else developing it. So they had nothing to do with the with the content. It was just given to them. Yeah. Now, now, look, now, what I was and students were sort of fee, yeah, they were they they were eligible to uh, yeah. help or you know, that's right. Now, a lot of the academic staff were very unhappy with when I was there with the arrangements with Swinburne Online because they were not even credited in the um, in the final produced course. Um, so they, they, they did feel. Um, what about the students? How did they? Do you think they had a sense of the fact that they weren't with us, with a subject being taught by a subject matter expert? Uh, I think the e-learning advisors are. They may not be the expert, but they are a expert. It's okay. not as if we drag people in off the streets. Okay. So they have subject matter knowledge, but they are not. They would. They're not. They wouldn't have driven the content. So, so they would be, be the like same a tutor. A tutor. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in fact, they were called tutors. They were e-learning tutors. Um, but they would never actually get to speak to a to the, the senior academic running the course or mm -hmm. who's, who's providing that course. I guess they wouldn't even know who it is. They probably wouldn't even know who it is. No, they wouldn't know who it is because that person was never credited. Mm -hmm. And yes. we have we have to be conscious, or Swinburne would have to be conscious <coughs> of of there being an equitable arrangement there, mm -hmm. same degree, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Same so we'll grade very different yeah, pathway. That's exactly right. So I, I mean, that was an area I didn't see too much of, uh, but I, uh, I did know that there was a lot of work done at uh, academic board level, um, and, the, and the, the courses still had to be um, progressed through the normal validation route. At the end of the day, they get a Swinburne University. It's very, very important. And in terms of the structure of the courses, Mark, is it again a focus on reading and on, you know, like discussion board interaction or what? Yes. So um, lots of lots of readings, mm -hmm. um, lots of text written by the learning designers. Uh, we tried to mm -hmm. we tried to get as much interactivity in there mm -hmm. as we could. They weren't very keen on video at all, so they used virtually no video. Mm -hmm. um, there were quizzes, quizzes and assessments, and then a, a, a high degree of focus on group work um, and uh, discussion. But again, Blackboard is very poor oh. at that, and uh, one of the biggest headaches was creating the groups and, and actually getting it into a format where it, it was easy to use and mm -hmm. you know, created an environment that was useful. Mm -hmm. um, and I think they, I mean, they, they could have done so much better. They made a bad choice at the start. Do you know what their retention was like? It was um, not. I don't know what it's not, what it is now. Yeah. It was it was quite poor to start with. It's about twenty five percent, I think. Mm -hmm. so it's very low. Mm -hmm. um, but they have improved a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly when I was leaving, they were doing a lot of work with learning analytics um, to pick up. Um, at risk students yeah. early on <coughs> and, um, and to provide them with assistance. And I think in that environment, it was, it was actually easier that, to do that than in, in the sort of environment we have here, yeah. the blended learning environment, um, because you, you have a direct comparison with other students. Um, 
option four is to outsource design and development of courses to a commercial provider. Now these, I, I just discovered in the last couple of days, these, these, there's actually a term for this, there's a, a three letter acronym and they are called online program managers. And basically what tends to happen is that you will say, you will approach a private company, a university approaches a private company, probably the other way around actually, and says we will manage your courses for you uh, online and we will have some of your fees, thank you. And um, so there are a few of those. Um, one is KeyPath, who, who RMIT are currently working with. They're an American um, advertising company, specialized marketing company in higher education. Who uh, uh, been doing that for the last 20 years, and then the last couple of years have, have moved into online education. So they, they work with the university, they'll say, we'll manage all of your courses, we'll look after everything, and we'll just take a look at your fees. We'll work with your learning site, with your subject matter experts, and we'll create it for you. So um, another famous one, a uh, very large one, is this is probably the largest um, of its kind in the world, academic partnerships. La Trobe University had an agreement with academic partnerships uh, to build their courses. And again, they, they will work with subject matter experts to build um, a whole range of courses and then they manage them for um, a proportion of the fee ongoing. I think An Andrea might talk about Pearson as well. Pearson also offer this sort of service. Now I put that into your slides section. Sorry? I put that into your slides. Oh, section. did you? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh. You will do it. Yes. So, <laughs> so, so Pearson. Um, <laughs> And uh, I was just looking at Pearson just before um, I went in here, and it turns out that the University of Florida, for example, signed a contract with Pearson for $186 million to deliver um, their courses over a period of 11 years. Um, something that, that um, after two years, broke down um, and oh. failed. Oh. Um, so there are quite a few horror stories in this, in this field. Pearson uh, to you did a similar thing at UNE, mm -hmm. and I gather that went pear shaped, to use the technical term. Yes. Um, I, I haven't got the details of that. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's there's, yeah. there's been a few. So with the Pearson's um, API models, they typically develop uh, kind of a carousel enrollment system. So enrollments are happening every six, eight, ten weeks. Um, and it run, they sort of run ongoing with very little break, very short breaks between semesters so students can get through a program at rapid pace. Um, everything is host, typically mm -hmm. hosted on their learning management system. Mm -hmm. um, so they handle all the marketing, all the intakes, um, the enrollments, and then the academics, tutors, some involvement in that, although I think some even offer kind of a, a tutoring service, a tutoring service um, within that. So it's really, really outsourced. Mm. Yeah. I, mean, I, th I think that's an interesting thing because uh, um, there's quite a range of models. So it's basically you can have a you know, all you can eat model where you, you give, you work with the, the partner and they provide everything. Or there are some services that will offer little bits of that. and. Um, there's some um, some uni some universities prefer not to give the whole thing out to a private provider, they, but they want they want little bits of the management um, aspect of it. They might want a bit of the learning side uh, aspect of it. And then a whole range of quality issues get raised with that. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and I mentioned this one. Um, this one's slightly different in that I designed a new. Um, is made up of people who left academic <coughs> partnerships. I, I, I personally have got much more time for this um, for this approach because it they, they, they do a fixed a fee a fee for service. So you you work with them. They 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 work with your academic staff. They produce something, but you know how much it's going to cost. Whereas with the other models, typically you might be paying fifty percent of your of your uh, student fees going to your private provider, which is quite a lot of money. Um, whereas with, with this model, you, you pay X thousands of dollars to have your course designed, and then it's yours. And, all, and, and they make quite a thing of all of the intellectual property and design and everything stays with the, with the originator. 
Um, so very, very quickly, a, a very quick overview of sort of moving from inside to semi-outside to, to wholly outside, that sort of continuum. And there are lots of variations in between um, of strategies for organizing uh, the, d the design and delivery of uh, online learning. And I haven't really talked too much about the technologies involved, and I think we might talk about that a bit more. The ones that I've, I've directly observed have been very traditional, and um, I think there are lots and lots of options for much more innovative and um, desirable solutions that provide a better experience. And, and one of those might come from, what I've called here is use a boot platform, but I'm just going to talk a bit about uh, if you could go to the next slide. Maybe first I'll just mention um, Open Universities Australia. So if we, is everybody familiar with how they work? So they are kind of like the marketing side of those other agencies. They're an aggregator. They are owned by seven shareholder universities, of which RMIT is one. And um, enrollments are occurring every, uh, what do they say, 12 weeks, 12, 13 weeks. Um, so there's four enrollments, um, four semesters a year, terms a year. And, but the delivery is done entirely by the universities who are teaching those programs. And when students get, study through OUA, they, don't, they get a, a degree qualification from the university, not from Open Universities Australia. Um, that was how OUA operated for a very long time. And then I guess it was 2012 that they started developing 2011, they started came up with the concept of Open to Study, which is a MOOC platform. So if you could go on to the next topic. Um, this was their first foray into creating, becoming a content creator themselves, and they had big ambitions, which was to develop 50 MOOCs <coughs> in one year, and which they did. Uh, wow. But but to do that, you you can't. Um, can't take a bespoke approach mm -hmm. um, to the design, so it was, it's a very specific type of delivery. Every MOOC is four weeks, it has four hours of video content. After, if, after every five to six minutes of video, there's a quiz question, and at the end of the week, there's a longer quiz, and there's a forum built in so people can ask questions and have the questions answered. They are not moderated by subject matter experts. Um, some academics, like um, Shane Halbert in art, when he did his uh, photography MOOC, he was really into it, so he went in and he did moderate things, but that was not a requirement. There were community managers who did that and would sort of uh, take any content issues to the academic and the academic would provide feedback on that. Uh, but they started to run a model where people who had done the MOOC and done a MOOC and really participated a lot could start to act as kind of, um, I don't know, they mentors. mentors within it, I guess. So they could be um, sort of lead, have, a, have a leadership role um, in answering questions and things like that within the MOOC. But obviously, to do this, to do this on this year time frame, um, Open Universities essentially created a startup within the organization. They took people from all over the organization, they built a new, uh, well, they modified Moodle, um, sort of bolted two systems together to build this system, and they built an in-house production team, and they had an external production team, and they hired people like Howard and me to assist the academics from the different universities and um, TAFEs to develop the content rapidly. It had to go, it went really quickly, and it was a system and templates, and you built these templates in, and we would review them and provide feedback, and it just, it ran like that. Um, so if you could go on to the, the next one. Oh, sorry, <coughs> I have to go back to the presentation. I actually had linked it. Oh, okay. um, sorry, you'll have to navigate not with clicking, but with the. Uh, oh, it's not with clicking, oh. sorry. Yes, not with clicking. Oh. Sorry. Maybe with Beth, that's okay. It's an annoying thing I tend to do. So, um, Future Learn is a very different approach to that on the openness side, um, on the MOOC side, um, where all the development is actually done by the universities 
who are the, the subject matter expertise behind the MOOCs. So we're currently developing two MOOCs. We do all the uh, design, we do all the content um, and production development, all of that, and then we build it into their platform and they promote it for us. Um, one of the, the nice things about FutureLearn is that it is not as templated as something like Open Study. There's a lot more freedom and it can be, uh, you, can, you can adopt an approach um, with it that works more for, you know, maybe the subject matter, it's a little bit more, you can make it a bit more personalized for your content. However, it is a very linear, uh, a very linear system. So it's, you're not, and it's a MOOC, so you have potentially tens of thousands of people registering in any one little short run course. And so things, some of the things like, you know, project-based work or group work, they're, they're not actively encouraging people to use those types of approaches because they're not, they're much harder to get to work on with large cohorts and it'll be very hard to make those work on their platform. So it's, a, it's a great platform, it works really well, it, but it isn't, um, it, there's, there's no space for co-creation co or student curation of things and that kind of student-driven approach um, that many of us, I think, mm. are trying to help others create in, in other areas. I could click through a couple. So they have a huge range of, of courses as well. Let me just keep going. And one of the big producers um, on FutureLearn is the University of Leeds. This is just a, a selection of their MOOCs. They have a huge variety that they offer. Um, and next. To do that, Leeds has their own digital learning team and whose focus is actually to develop uh, external facing resources. So if this is for iTunes U, um, sort of open educational resources and their, their MOOC uh, content. And I say their website isn't nearly as No, nice. that's what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting work, flat website. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so this is uh, um, this is just an example of one of the things that, that they do, um, and they have quite an interesting team with lots of different skill sets. So they really are producing an incredible number of MOOCs, and to do that, they've obviously created a kind of a center where that's mm -hmm. the focus, and they're they're working on on that. Um, and one of the things Leeds <coughs> is doing now, if you go to the next one, is um, they are looking at actually giving people credit for doing their MOOCs on FutureLearn that they can transfer over to the university. Uh, this was just announced um, in May, which is mm -hmm. interesting, an interesting approach because universities have taken a lot of different approaches mm -hmm. to how to monetize MOOCs. If this is a way to offer content, well, how do you try to, how do you make that work for you financially? So on the next, there are, are these different way, models that people have used. So open to study, it's free. It's there, you don't pay anything, you never pay anything to go into these MOOCs. Some offer low cost options, so it's you know $30, $40 to do something. Some, you can do everything, you can access everything, but if you want a certificate <coughs> of achievement or completion, you have to pay. Some you can pay to have your your assessments marked and get feedback on them. And Coursera is now going down the road of using some of their MOOCs to now create programs in conjunction with other universities. So I think it's the University of Illinois. They're offering the I, IMBA, which is using the course, grouping <coughs> some of the Coursera specialization courses together um, into creating a program. Um, and the other model is to try to convert enrollments, which is, I think, part of what Open Universities Australia was trying mm -hmm. to do, which um, hasn't proved, I think, for universities in general, a very effective model for driving, for having that openness mm -hmm. and then driving people into the, the paid programs. And I think that's it for me. Okay. So, um, 
Lee, just going to talk to us a bit about some different thoughts to do with how we deliver value online. Yep, try and get it down to five minutes through three minutes over the discussion. <laughs> um, so the, the very premise of our approach is that uh, that is not an example yet from the university of successfully de developing online learning. In my 12 years of experience with seven institutions, uh, from the lens that I put onto it, or the criteria that I put onto it at least, there isn't an example of success. Um, and to try and illustrate that is to try and compare to where online learning is uh, very evidently successful, and that's in informal learning. <coughs> so if we were to think about the university in terms of the left column, publishing industry, the television sector, the industry, the cinema, the films, festivals, the theatre, news and journalism, obviously they're all operating on an old paradigm of practice with older methods of um, development and, and measures of success and all of them struggle to relate to a new world uh, that um, people talk about that has been enabled from the internet. On the right is uh, key words that illustrate that new world internet is largely developed, or the web, I should say, is largely developed in hacker culture. That's not the hacker that is being used by news media in the left column, who struggle to understand the right column. Hacker culture is uh, a very different thing to malicious software and all of that sort of stereotyping. Uh, the internet and software generally comes from free software, uh, and otherwise some people call that open source software. Open and crowdsource finance, um, content like Wikipedia and software and things like that is uh, an operating principle and partly the reason why the likes of Microsoft are hated so vehemently by other programmers is because of the belief at least that Microsoft stole from the open source community and closed down their work. Yes, with grit of teeth we have to bear it. Networked gift economies uh, is another theory of Yoshi Bankler writes about um, the wealth of networks, uh, and he looks outward. So he works in a university, but he doesn't even reference to the university as an example of explaining that. He looks out into the internet. Uh, radical transparency comes from um, comes from this is uh, an initiative by Government 2.0, which was an attempt to get government data into the open internet, to create a Commons licensing of uh, government generated content, etc. Uh, but further to make more transparent the processes in which uh, agencies work and their decision uh, decision paths and things like that. Connected to that is open data. Peer-to-peer uh, -peer file sharing, otherwise people might know that as Pirate Bay or BitTorrent file sharing, is an example of a, of a very obvious sector that's um, thriving and, and flourishing despite what <coughs> the left the column would do through law and other sort of overt and contrived methods to try and control the emerging economy. Folksonomy is a word as opposed to taxonomy. Taxonomy is something the libraries like to think about. Folksonomy is quite different to that linked to folklore and folk music and things like that. I use a word that tries to encompass all of those called webism, as in socialism, as in feminism, as in Marxism. It's a belief system or a, a group of ideologies that is inspired by the internet and the universities have played no part in any of this. <coughs> so the next slide. The foundation of this webism comes from postmodernism, uh, to, to level it up a bit to some sort of scholarly level. Uh, these are the authors that I would cite who inspired this, uh, who wrote before there was such a thing as an internet, but arguably and observably inspired many of the e ethics and ideologies that drive internet as a technology. <coughs> the BBC documentarian Adam Curtis makes good documentaries to try and uncover the underlying ideologies that become the technology, not just the programming technology, but the very institutions and processes we use. And the most recent one he made is called um, All Watched Over by Machines of Loving Grace. And it's a, quite a good documentary to look at the interesting found foundations, ideological foundations, and make what the internet mixed with the military um, uh, investment of the internet, so the web and the internet, and, and the thing that's produced as a result of that combination. On the right, I've just cited uh, Discalling Society, which for me is fundamentally the internet. Uh, in 
terms of informal learning webs and the, uh, the easily measurable success of online learning as opposed to the failures. So the next slide. So we in university struggle to relate um, those, those uh, polarized experiences. There's what we do in the university based on a paradigm <coughs> and a premise that not many of us question. There's what we could, if we looked, can observe going on outside of our, our, our remit. Um, but so few of us have any way to look and observe. Naturally, in my line of work, I, I read research that's published to do with education. Almost all of it is introverted. It looks at groups of people we class as students, uh, enrolled in an experience that we call a course, and measuring outcomes based on activities we describe as assessment. And almost none of them look at how to measure informal learning as it takes place outside. So that, from, from what I can observe of research, that creates a big blind spot because our practice then is to do literature reviews and to benchmark in risk averse culture. We never expose ourselves to these outside ideas. We don't have a mechanism for doing it. So I kind of come to the conclusion that our basic premise of how learning happens is in an old paradigm and that premise prevents us from realizing how it really happens now. So the next the slide, I think it's almost the finals. Um, these are no, by no means the best examples. The Free University International closed in 1981, but was started in 1976 by artist Joseph um, uh, Boys, German artist, fantastic artist. Uh, and he's, it, he was representing those early ideologies um, and ideas and methods of Foucault and Illich of trying to free the university um, ideal, unlocking it from its, its kind of institutional uh, dogma. Melbourne Free University, right here in Melbourne, and partly the reason I moved to Melbourne um, <coughs> exists, and, and we don't have any relationship or understanding of how that works. Network learning is an idea. <coughs> uh, there's a Wikipedia article around that, which I've largely been the author of that, and it's an attempt to try and look at examples of people writing about this phenomenon of folk informal learning. And some of the earliest writing I've found is when we installed telegraph lines in the 1860s and other things that were when railways were built and things like that. Some interesting ideas and examples of when we were able to look outside. Student as producer is an interesting example of um, uh, University of Lincoln did a three year project on the basis of students as producers of content and we'll look at some examples in a, in a real short second. Open academic practice is also another catchphrase and we talked about that at the scholarly teaching and learning session uh, earlier this week, was it or last week? Last week. Final, uh, final slides. Um, so examples of a more lateral arrangement where institutions, not just universities, are able to observe what happens outside and then to align their practices to be complementary to those. These aren't by any means excellent examples, <coughs> they're just examples of the beginnings of that lateral thinking and the boundaries permeating and breaking down a little bit. So Wiki Project Med, um, from what I understood, but I'm just reading on the page now, I thought it was a Canadian initiated project, and I still think it is, but it's since morphed, morphed into a non-profit organization based in New York, and their mission, to make clear, reliable, comprehensive, up-to-date educational resources and information in the biomedical and related social sciences, freely available to all people in the language of their choice, using the Wikipedia project. I'm not aware of any university that's endeavored to engage in such mission. <coughs> so uh, but this is a network of um, non-university organizations, but I'm pretty sure it was sparked by a Canadian um, um, emergency uh, uh, doctor. We call those people in emergency wards. Yeah, he started and it just grew and grew and grew until it became an example of institutions engaging with, 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 with Wikipedia rather than banning it or obfuscating it doing their best to lift the standard of medical um, coverage on, on not just English. Uh, quickly, the, the next, um, I've personally been involved in the history of the Paralympics Australia project. Their initial um, call for, t for, for expression of interest was to help them write the history of the Paralympics. Uh, at the University of Canberra, we 
saw what was going on in Project Med and other, many other examples, so we suggested that they write it in Wikipedia. That was, um, that was something they weren't expecting. But because we made the proposal open source, in other words, the first sentence of our proposal was on a website, they were compelled to watch the proposal develop. And in that process, a very interesting process because while the rest of the Tandra's University of Qu uh, Queensland University of Technology, for example, were writing their applications up to the due date and then sending it, we were writing our application months before and was on the web and developing and inviting um, contribution. So naturally, we got the tender. Um, that wasn't what we set out to do, but it was an interesting dynamic that created by opening it, developing the, um, the proposal. So as a result of that, um, uh, the International Paralympics Organization has now changed the way they manage their um, their uh, press releases and their coverage and stuff, making sure that it's licensed so that they can go up on Wikipedia. Next slide. All these examples are wikis, I'm sorry, but yeah, they're just some of the better ones, I guess, that I know of. Well, we have been asked um, just in the last month to work on a, a, a database of environmental art um, projects, which <coughs> we will put into. Yeah, yeah, it would be interesting to get another. I think the wikis, it's not because of the technology, um, you know, it's not really to do with wikis, it's because it's really the only domain where that, those earlier ideologies of the internet, that webism stuff, have been allowed to exist and flourish. In, an enclosure around those ideologies, commercialization and corporate interest and stuff has happened everywhere else on the internet, but in projects like the Wikimedia and the projects in the Commons, has basically resisted. There is no advertising or no commercial interest in any of this space. Not that that's an enemy to it all, it just has helped to prevent any of that enclosure or, or on the ideologies. Uh, this is the student authored open textbook, a very interesting story. Um, a, a teacher, as it commonly is, is given a subject that they know nothing about to teach. Um, there was a textbook that they would rely on, like a bit like models we just saw before, uh, but in this instance a past student made a very formal complaint about the textbook and <coughs> successfully got it removed from the course, uh, leaving the course, the sub of the course with no textbook. So the teacher contacted me, I was working in that faculty, and I said, well, how about students, you know, just change the essays to not being essays, but the chapters in the Wiki textbook uh, to psychology, um, the course, by the way. Uh, and as a result of that, three years it took to get, like the first iteration, there was a, a massive amount of content, but naturally only some of it was to a standard of a textbook. But after three years, that, 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 the quantity of that standard um, naturally increases, and now they have a, an open source textbook that can be freely used. The old textbook used to cost 160. This costs nothing and can be printed and bound for $12. Uh, so the next. University of Wollongong, journalism students write into the Wiki News project, um, and the teacher's marking workload has gone through the floor because he has managed to establish a relation with the volunteers on Wiki News. Wiki News is quite a robust um, uh, journalism publishing <coughs> site, as he's forced a relationship with the, that community to say, <coughs> if my students get onto the front page, in other words, pass your peer review, they pass my course. <laughs> Authentic <laughs> assessment. Yeah. Yes. At first it was a problem, and still is to, to a degree, because they overwhelmed volunteers, too many students. <laughs> um, and unfortunately, going back to my criticism of the university, the wider faculty don't recognise the um, innovation or uniqueness of this, and have prevented the teacher coming through with their promise of getting postgraduates to be um, um, reviewers, editorial reviewers, and assist the volunteers. So it looks like that project is endangered. I think that's the last one. Oh, my own personal attempt, uh, as unqualified as I am, to do one of the only that I'm aware of um, uh, research projects to look at how informal learning takes place out in inside the institutions and to measure it in terms of learning outcomes. Uh, that's it, I think. So, yeah, 
the only reason I put that in there is, in my opinion, it's not to be polarizing. Mm. It's a genuine hope that we can find a way to bring in a viewpoint which is actually a pre-compromised viewpoint. I have a more extreme view over here. This is the compromised version. Um, and, and to try and um, find a way to create space where we can actually be unique and innovative in this space on the naive belief that these institutions are open to that. That's all from me. Thank you, Lee. I was just going to say, I think that's interesting because well, one of the things we have, haven't talked about here is budget. And that a lot of the models that we spoke oh. about initially are big budget mm. courses yeah. and that it isn't achievable. It's not the, thing you, the kind of thing you can do unless you have the university <laughs> behind you in some way or you have a partnership and you have the agreement about the fee split that will fund it. That a lot of these are online budget is. Well, it started with a with a ten million dollar investment. Yeah. Um, so that was their that was their, their startup mm -hmm. fees, and they they make about twenty eight million dollars a year, yeah. something like that. That's interesting because yeah. some of those big budget courses are not necessarily the learning experience. It's not. It's just it's no, it's not it's more. It's it, well, way less authentic. It's yeah. more removed from yeah. the types of things. That you can because do. the the student author textbook says on their page they, they, they won $5,000 from the university and spent not a cent of it mm. and returned it. And as a result of that, the university naturally thinks the project failed. <laughs> 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 but, I, but you're right. I, I, I think it's really interesting that the more money that is spent and the more investment, often the, 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 the conservatism about what is produced <laughs> in terms of online learning is increased and you end up with very I always think that there's no sense of humour in, in online education there's no fun, it's just very, very the, what I see of it is very dull and very boring and there's almost no student co-creation in any of those and because it's seen as being risky and I think that there is a whole uh, opportunity for creating actually what I haven't included in here which is the creative practice research um, website, which is an opportunity for people to share artifacts and build things and to genuinely engage socially in social learning um, in all sorts of very flexible ways. Um, create courses that are not time boxed, create courses that you don't have to recreate every, 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 every few months. Don't create the courses at all, just create the space where people talk. Um, there's lots of options. but. I don't know. We're, we're, I think we're, RMIT is in a very interesting point at the moment where we could go down lots of different routes, and I'd kind of like us to go down a really interesting one. <laughs> Any thoughts, <laughs> questions? Um, that was really thought provoking. Thank you yeah. so much. Mm, having that spectrum of the, the formal, the expensive, the <coughs> traditional, counterbalanced with those grassroots mm. kinds of issues was a fascinating, yeah. a really, really useful way to present that because um, yeah. it's kind of... It was all planned. It, it doesn't have to be. <laughs> <laughs> well, I suppose it says it doesn't have to be either or. No, mm. there's no reason no. why we can't, you know, pull things together in, in interesting ways that don't necessarily dodgy and seem to be dodgy, you know, there are ways of... I think there is an example is some of our thinking together around how we deal with RMIT's issuing of a Google account. And it's, a, it's an example yeah. where uh, RMIT provides a Google account to students and staff and doesn't seem to be showing any evidence of realising that the students are 100% transient and 70% of the staff are transient and this account uh, has very limited value or use. They're just seeing it as a tool, and that's all. What we're trying to explain to staff and, stu and students through staff is that this is essentially Google, and at the moment it's the permanent search engine for how you access information, and Google's usefulness to you improves as you use it. So when you get a brand new account, it has no use much to you because it has no record of your use of it. And when 
not to spend three years using it, it has used to you, and then it's taken away from you, because okay, you no longer assume your stuff. So that's an example is somewhat of a modernized old paradigm way of thinking. A new paradigm way of thinking is to simply question that and say, we should actually encourage students and staff to use their own account, teach them how to use that account so that it improves in relevance and et cetera, so that it goes with them beyond. So that is an example of, of, of the premise guiding that, which you can expand now if you start creating. But we also need to create learning environments that <coughs> straddle beyond the institution. That we can, we can, we always want to pull people in, um, and have a space where practitioners can be as well, and that's very much what CPR is about. And it's it's a part of a project that we're working on now called Bail, which is a very advanced learning environment. That should sell. That'll sell. And and it, it's designed to do that. It's to straddle the university boundaries so that anybody can come into that space. And, and create um, the, the sorts of learning environments that they actually want to. So it's a space where learners and educators who are just more advanced learners, to be honest, um, all, have, all have agency. At the moment, uh, people have very little agency in online spaces, uh, online learning spaces, I should say. So this is the work in architecture and design around their PhD program, it is. is that it? Yeah. yeah. Um, so we're going to take that, that work's nearly finished. So we're going to take that work and and, uh, and, and go bananas with it. Mm. Um, I think we should do a similar session for the university. Um, open it up, uh, present some of the stuff, um, and show the the work that you've been doing in Val in the creative practice space. Mm. I think because I think really, who are they going to be seeking advice from? as decisions get made. I think a lot of the expertise sits here in the room. Would you be up for a session? I sign me up. You're very good. You're so good. I mean, you can incorporate other people. It could be an yeah. discussion yeah. or a debate. Yeah, like you yeah. did with the MOOC thing. Yeah. DSC versus the university. <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot of it is domain specific, I think, as well. You know, yeah, I, it's I, linked I, to I think that our needs are are very unique in uh, this college. Well, maybe I mean we can uh, just open it up to the college, to staff in the college. There'd be many staff who are interested who are thinking, I really want to go online, but I'm not part of Key Path. I don't even know what Key Path is. Or, you know, I've not got a MOOC. How did you get a MOOC? You know, how do I put my hand up for this? Do I need it? What if I'm what is a MOOC plus people? Lots of the people yeah. out there. Yes. Are. What does it mean to MOOC? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to MOOC. Yeah. 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 Anyway. Well, yeah. <laughs> Andrew, I don't know. If it, I don't mean to sound like a secret fan, um, but uh, it's a mystery to me, at least, of how we are entering into arrangement with Key Park and and others. Um, but you're not alone. It's a mystery to many. Yes. many. So I'm alone. thinking that it isn't much use, it seems, to talk to the masses. 70% transient staff who apparently need ideas. I think it needs to talk to whoever it is that gets us into these arrangements that we then criticise. So yeah, a little mini conference. Yes. <laughs> well, you know, actually, well, you know when Belinda comes for her yeah. day, yeah, yeah, we yeah. could do this as yeah. part of her day. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, we could. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Come and meet. She didn't want to <laughs> do PowerPoint in her day. She didn't oh, want it. Oh, she didn't want just, you know, hours cards. of PowerPoint. Flash cards. It's the DSC way. We don't have to have PowerPoint. PowerPoint just there so we can remember what we were going to say. Yeah. So, you know. I actually think those models like are really helpful, helpful to yeah. see the degree. <laughs> That's so what PowerPoint is good. It's text, 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 text. Take the mesh. Oh, yeah, we've got a headache to people. Mm. Well, look, we could act it out. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's right. Hand to mind. Yeah, hand to Yeah, have a book. I'd rather spell it out. Someone can speak behind you, the people will be acting it out. <laughs> but it, it really is worth, I mean, obviously, you know, a, a lot of these views also get shared on our, on our blog, mm. um, but it doesn't mean that those that want to be there will be mm. blog. But there mm. are, and you have talked about, are you having some uh, uh, 
events, mm. you know, or even the idea of a debate, I think also a, a discussion and I think that'd be really good uh, around a lot of these issues because we are preaching to the converted, you know, maybe not, but <laughs> <laughs> but you know these issues really just don't get aired enough uh, no. around the university, and I think th there'd be many staff who haven't thought of it that way, and it's not like they don't want to, just haven't seen it quite that way. Totally, totally agree on John. I think many staff are, don't look above the, uh, the parapet. I'm not blaming mm -hmm. them because no, their work pressure is so, yeah. so it is, and so it always will be. When actually things things are changing, and, it, and, and we, we have a, an opportunity to, to question why we're doing the same things that we were doing 30, 100 years ago. It, um, it's very interesting, you know, our new DBCE, um, Belinda is very keen to show examples of really innovative practice and really good practice. And stuff like that. Now, often when we think of what is good innovative practice, we think lots of dollars are nearly polished, but maybe as part of that, there are other ways to look at it and, and, uh, and other opportunities mm -hmm. that really are innovative, that really do engage students and if we're being mm. you know, real about engaging our students, about student satisfaction and all of that, let's go and look at some alternatives that, that are uh, Absolutely. popular. Yeah. But I, I really value um, Lee's contribution here because it's not just innovative practice, it's, no. it's practice that is subverting the paradigms, you know, it's really calling into question the, the basic premises on which everything else is, is uh, it rests and that's when we get new stuff, you know, so often innovation is just, you know, piling on new, new gizmos on top of <laughs> the existing foundation, so I, I just think that that part of the presentation is I honestly don't think staff need to be exposed to, to that. Um, oh, I do. Well, I, I got, I'm very much more optimistic about uh, staff generally, um, just teaching staff and stuff like that. I just think that that paradigm stuff is derailing. You know, it creates a noisy, um, um, chaotic space. to those who are in a privileged position of making strategy that then guides practice. I think this university, like all universities, does a good job of pretending to be a democracy, but it's nothing of the sort. And, uh, and perhaps um, we just have to admit that and try and influence the autocrats who determine behavior. I never thought no. it was pretending to be one. <laughs> oh, shake our I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I agree with you because I think I think so a lot of staff feels that they need permission to um, to be think very differently about how they run their course or how they and ideas, learning. Yeah, just out yeah. their ideas that, that spark yeah. their own. And, and I think that if they not understand for why, you know, rationale or framework to their to their working with that kind of thing that's missing a whole lot of the time. Mm -hmm. Like the bigger Okay, well, I think we blow everybody's minds there, so. Oh, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Has the beginning of the presentation been captured? It's recorded. It's recording, yeah. Audio recording. Podcast. Podcast. Well, I'm not sure, because we have to review what's said. Yeah, maybe just send it to Helen. Yeah. Do we say too many company names? What was it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Too many, uh, yeah. Yeah. too many times. Yeah. 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 Yeah.